So I've been using Cubase for the last 20 years. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to show you my favorite tips and tricks that I use every day. I'm using Cubase Pro 13. You may find that some of the tips I go through are not available in Cubase Elements or Artist, but the vast majority of them are. My first tip and feature which I couldn't live without is Cubase's ability to show multiple MIDI controller lanes at once. So here in the MIDI editor, I've got some held trombone chords, and you can see that I'm making use of both MIDI CC1 modulation and MIDI CC11 expression to add some musicality to the samples. By having multiple MIDI controller lanes viewable, it is so much easier to get a true representation and overview of your MIDI CC programming. While controllers such as modulation and expression are useful for longer sounds, for more shorter articulations like percussion hits, I will want to see the velocity lane. I could click down here to select the velocity lane, but I've set up some controller lane presets, so I can easily move to different combinations of visible lanes. You can even assign key commands to each preset over in the key command setup window and searching for controller lane setup. Another function which I absolutely couldn't live without is the retrospective record function. Imagine you're playing around on your MIDI controller, trying out ideas. You stumble upon a progression or melodic idea which you like, but you're not actually recording it. By going to Transport, MIDI Respective Recording, and then Insert from All MIDI Inputs, Cubase will magically capture the idea that you just played. You can even assign a key command. I've assigned the letter R to capture the MIDI recording. I use Retrospective Record so much that I actually rarely go into record mode and just use this way of inputting most of my MIDI from my controllers. Cubase has some fantastic functions when it comes to managing a large number of tracks. Some composers have templates which stretch into thousands of tracks, which can be a pain to navigate around. By clicking on the visibility tab over here next to the inspector, you can show or hide various combinations of tracks. By right clicking on the visibility list, it will bring up some options such as show tracks with data. In this case, Cubase only shows the tracks which already have some kind of event on them. Or another favorite of mine is to show tracks with data between the locators. Another method for managing large templates is the insanely useful Find Tracks function. Accessed by clicking the magnifying glass above the track list, or by using the default key command of Ctrl or Command plus F, you can quickly search for and navigate to a specific track. So I'm going to search for a suspended symbol track. I type in suspended symbol, it's found the track, and then I just need to press Enter for Cubase to take me straight to the track. Another function which helps with managing larger projects more easily, the Divide Tracklist feature lets you keep important global tracks such as chord tracks, marker tracks, or video tracks, always visible at the top of the screen. These can be useful particularly if you want to refer to something like the chord track, when you're working on a track deep down within your template, which you have to scroll down ages for. To divide the tracklist, you can simply go to Project and click Divide Tracklist, or click this tiny button on the far right hand side below the ruler. Any global tracks which you already have in the project, such as a chord, tempo, or signature track, will be automatically added to the upper track list. You can see that when I scroll down, the two tracks I have at the top are still visible. Here's a tip which I picked up from Hans Zimmer posting on the VI Control forum. By adding and then disabling an audio track, you get this grayed out track appearance which can be useful as a way of visually dividing up your track list into say different families of instruments. So start by adding an audio track, delete the actual track name, and then right click on it and select disable selected tracks. You can then add a few, moving them to different locations in your track list to visually break up your tracks. The next feature which I can't live without is Cubase's chord track. I personally use it more as a visual guide to remind me of the chords I've chosen for when I'm writing harmony parts, such as Celli arpeggio lines. There is also the functionality via the Chord Assistant for Cubase to suggest chord progressions or even individual chords, which it thinks might work well for your track. So to add a chord track, simply go up to Project, Add Track, Chord. My own personal preference is to turn off Show Scales, 
So you can do that by clicking this button. I also tend to have the chord track muted, so I'm only hearing the actual MIDI data that I've created. Once you have the chord track, you can add chords by firstly selecting the pencil tool and clicking in a spot where you want to add a chord. Cubase will initially produce an X. You can then edit this by changing to the select tool and then double clicking on the X to bring up the chord editor. The options for chords is pretty extensive. You can select the chord quality, any extensions, along with the bass note. For example, if a chord is in first inversion. Another great feature is the ability to automatically work out or essentially transcribe the chords from an audio file. With an audio region selected, go up to project, chord track, create chord events. You can see I've even assigned it to a key command. In my case, Shift plus C. While I find it isn't always 100% accurate, it has certainly helped me to figure out a tricky harmony when I've been analyzing other composers' chord progressions. Some sampled instruments feature a small amount of delay from when a note is triggered via MIDI to when you actually hear the note. There are various reasons for these delays, but for libraries such as Cinematic Studio Strings, the delay helps to facilitate the legato programming. So let's just play this violin part from Cinematic Studio Strings with no pre-delay. You can hear that the violins are not aligned to Cubase's click. According to the Cinematic Studio Strings manual, for the legato style I am triggering, I need to add 333 milliseconds of pre-delay to ensure the notes are triggered early enough to audibly line up with Cubase's grid. So to add that pre-delay, I'll want to go up to the delay field here in the inspector for the track and type in minus 333. Now you should hear that the part is much more in time with the grid. Another handy function which I use all the time to speed up the editing workflow is the paste at origin function. Say I want to add this Irish flute part down into a violin track. Normally I would first make sure the part is selected, then cut or copy it before then moving the cursor to the beginning of the region before then pasting. To speed up the workflow, I can simply copy the whistle part, scroll down to a violin track and then select project, function, paste at origin. This will then paste the event to the same position in time from where I copied it from. Even better is to use the default key command of Alt plus V. I find this function particularly useful when copying MIDI controller data between different MIDI parts, and it really helps to speed up the editing process. If you're finding these tips for using Cubase useful, and want to learn how to compose cinematic music using my proven four-step composing framework, check out the link below to sign up for my free training. Cubase's global copy function was a tip I picked up from a film and TV composer I used to work for, Maurizio Malagnini. Imagine you are working on a cue and you need to move parts of your music around to help fit your music to a new picture edit. You could select all of the MIDI and audio regions using the scissor tool to cut before then copying and pasting the regions containing your music to a new location in the project. If you have elements such as tempo information in a tempo track which is hidden or time signature changes, these won't be automatically copied though. So a solution for this is to use the global copy function, which will ensure every bit of data that is between your left and right locators, including elements like markers, core track information, or tempo and time signature data, will be copied. So to do this, simply set your left and right locators so that they encompass the area you want to copy, and then go up to edit, range, and then select global copy. Then jump to the location that you want to copy to, and then edit, paste, or of course, Control or Command plus V. Imagine you need to extend your piece to fit a picture change by adding a couple of bars into the middle of a cue. The Insert Silence function is also similar to the Global Copy function in that it will move all the data at a global level, including tempo and time signature information. Firstly, change your left locator to the location where you want the extra bars added. I want to add some silence from bar 10, so I'll type in 10 into the left locator. I then want to add two bars, so we'll set the right locator to 12. Then go up to Edit, Range, Insert Silence. You'll see that two blank bars have been added to the location that the locators encompass. 
with all the information including tempo and time signatures shifted as well. A small but mighty function for me in Cubase is its tap tempo function, which helps me to find the BPM quickly of an existing piece or idea I have. By tapping the button down here with the mouse in time with some music, as a quarter note pulse, Cubase will work out the BPM of your project. Here it's worked out the tempo of my taps was 84.5 BPM. There are then a few options available in terms of what to do with the newfound tempo. By clicking this arrow to the right hand side, you can select options such as insert the tempo event at the beginning of your project, or say from the cursor position onwards. Before Cubase 13, tap tempo was found in the beats calculator, which is accessed from the project menu. Since version 13, the tap tempo function is now found down here in the transport panel. Here is a function which I use primarily when preparing MIDI data for exporting to a notation program. As well as quantizing notes so that the beginning of each note snaps to Cubase's grid, I'll always make sure that the end of notes are quantized as well. Without the note end quantized, when exporting as a MIDI file to open up in, say, a notation program, this note would appear as maybe a half note, tied to a quarter note, tied to an eighth note, tied to a sixteenth note. By quantizing the note end, it means that once exported as a MIDI file, this note would now appear as a nice and clean whole note in the notation software. So to quantize the note ends, here in the MIDI editor, firstly select a single or multiple notes, before then selecting a quantized value such as an eighth note up here. Then make sure the quantized pane is open here, where you can find the quantize ends option. You can see the end of the note has been extended to the end of the bar. Again, I've set a key command for quantizing note ends to Shift plus Q to help further speed up my workflow. When exporting MIDI data from Cubase to a notation program, I'll usually duplicate the original MIDI data onto separate tracks, so that I don't affect how the original MIDI data performs or sounds. Here's a nifty little function that you can use when you want to experiment with auditioning and edit, before you actually make the edit. Say I want to potentially delete everything between bars 17 and 25, but want to have a quick listen to see if it will work first. For this, I'll need to use the locators. Normally with the left and right locators, the left locator has a position that is earlier in time than the right locator. For example, here I have the left locator set to bar 17 and the right locator set to 25. If I reverse them, so the left locator is now at 25 and the right at 17, Watch what happens when I activate cycle mode, by clicking this button on the transport panel and then playing from say bar 16. The cursor jumps from the end of bar 16 straight to 25. So you can easily check out how an edit could flow musically before actually making the edit. There is also a menu item that enables you to quickly swap the left and right locators. Go up to Transport, Locators, Exchange Left and Right Locator Positions. Another function that I use on just about every piece I write is Cubase's Marker Tracks function, and more specifically using Cycle Markers. Cubase will enable you to have two types of markers, Position Markers and Cycle Markers. I find myself using the Cycle Markers more as they help me to visually see the bars that make up a particular section in my piece. You can add markers by firstly adding a marker track. Go to Project, Add Track, Marker. Then to add a cycle marker, you first need to set your left and right locators to the start and end points of a selection you want. You can do this quickly by selecting a region and then pressing P on your keyboard. Next, to insert the marker, you need to go to Project, Markers, or Command or Control plus M. To add a cycle marker, Click the Add Cycle Marker button up here on the left hand side, before then typing a name into the description here. I will also normally colour these cycle markers separately, depending on whether it's an A, B, C, or intro or outro section. By firstly making sure the cycle marker is selected, then clicking this Select Colour for Selected Tracks or Event button. This tip was a game changer for me back when I was scoring my first feature film in 2011, using a 2008 MacBook Pro, which had a grand total of 4GB of RAM. 
Very quickly, I ran out of memory and even processing power to play back the samples. So I made use of a handy function called freeze instrument, literally all of the time. The easiest way to freeze a particular track is to click this snowflake icon on the track that you would like to freeze. If you don't see that, you'll need to right click and select track control settings. From here, you should see the freeze function over in the hidden control panel on the left hand side. Click add and it will move the button to the visible controls on the right hand side. If you still don't see it, you may have to increase the value in the controls area width as well. So back in the track list, here I click the freeze channel icon and that pops a couple of options. I will always make sure both of these boxes are ticked along with adding a tail size of say two seconds. Cubase then goes ahead and renders the audio of that track. And then if you take to the bottom checkbox, we'll also unload the instrument from your RAM. If I were to play back, I would hear exactly the same audio as compared to before the track was frozen. But the main difference is that the MIDI region is now locked, so I can't edit the MIDI anymore. If I wanted to go back in and edit the MIDI, I have to press the freeze channel snowflake button again, which will unfreeze the track, reloading the instrument into RAM, and depending on the option you select, will delete the previous freeze audio file that was created. This small but mighty function has also saved me a ton of time in the past. Simply, this function will select all the regions which begin to the right of the cursor. You can access the function by going to edit, select, and then from cursor to end. I've also assigned my own key command, shift plus A, which again speeds up my workflow. If you have your track list divided, like I do, note that Cubase will only select data which is in the focus area, shown by the solid white lines to the sides. I use this all the time, particularly when I want to rewrite something but don't want to delete the MIDI, instead moving the regions to later on in the project. There is also the opposite function available, select from start to cursor, which you can access from the same place. Edit, select, and then start to cursor. Another function which I use all the time is the various ways you can manipulate MIDI velocities from either the velocity controller lane of the key editor or through the velocity dialog box. So here is a percussion part I have. If I first select all of the notes using Command or Control plus A, now if I hover the mouse over the top in the center here, this handle will let you scale the velocities vertically, raising or lowering them all, whilst keeping the proportions between each. In addition, by going to MIDI and then Functions, and then Velocity, there are a whole host of other ways we can edit the velocity data, including adding or subtracting values, compressing or expanding the dynamic range, limiting velocities, and so on. I've set a key command of V, so when I have a series of notes selected, it brings the velocity dialog box up quickly. I almost always make use of the show global tracks feature in the top of the key or MIDI editor window. Global tracks like the core track help me to remember the underlying harmony which I have previously set out. It can also be useful having other global tracks such as time signatures, tempo tracks or markers visible as well. To show the global tracks which you already have in your project, make sure you click the global tracks button in the top left hand corner here. And finally, here's a quick function that I use more for curiosity than anything else. When I finished a piece, I often like to use the bypass inserts and bypass sends buttons in the top of the mixer, which globally disables all of the inserts or sends you've used in a project in one go. I use it just to see how the piece sounds without any plugins which I've used for mixing purposes. I'm often very surprised at how muddy and unclear everything sounds when I haven't say used my trusty FanFilter Pro Q2 plugin on various instruments inserts. I'm sure there are more important uses for the functionality of these buttons, but again, it's more of a curiosity thing for me. Okay, so there are some heavyweight tools such as the Time Warp tool, Expression Maps, or the Logical Editor that I don't find myself using often, so I haven't included in this video. It goes without saying that Cubase is such a deep program. I have barely scratched the surface with these tips here. So to now put these tips into practice, check out my video on melody writing. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.